You're not going to solve global warming by telling people no. You're not going to solve this by telling people you can't fly, you can't go on your car, you can't eat meat, you can't do all these things that you like to do because of the climate. You can try and do it, but you will probably see very, very strong resistance. Hello and welcome to Unheard, the channel that looks out for herd mentality wherever we find it. And there's a lot of it about. Where we see it, we try to provide a more sensible, more balanced perspective. One thing we haven't spoken a lot about is climate change. As the COP26 summit meets over the next couple of weeks in Glasgow, expect to be bombarded with disaster scenarios, stories of our species' imminent demise. Well, Björn Lombori is a Danish writer. He's visiting fellow at the Hoover Institution at Stanford, and he has made himself an expert on climate science over the years. He is author of False Alarm, How Climate Change Panic Costs Us Trillions, Hurts the Poor, and Fails to Fix the Planet. And as you can tell from the title of his book, he brings a slightly different message. He joins us now from Sweden. Hi Bjorn. Hey, good to meet you, Freddy. First of all, congratulations on such a beautiful living room. It looks like you're single-handedly <laughs> fixing the global warming problem there. <laughs> yeah, no, that actually doesn't do very much. But yes, uh, we have lots of plants. So we have a whole uh, 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 greenhouse, like winter garden out there, uh, and two greenhouses out here. So yeah, I love plants. So let me start by saying that your view of this whole issue is not that there isn't a problem. You think the global warming is real and that it is in largely man-made. Let's start by just kind of establishing that because a lot of people might reject the whole thing as some kind of myth, but you actually, you're a kind of centrist in that respect that you, you, you think it is real. Look, Freddie, I mean, I'm, I'm a social scientist. I just meet with a lot of, of the natural scientists who've looked at climate change. I mean, I've read the UN climate panel reports. I don't think there's any reason to say that it is not such. Global warming is real. Global warming is man-made. It is a significant problem. But we still need to have that conversation about, so there's a problem. How do we fix it? How do we fix it smartly? And how do we place it among all the other problems that are also there, there's a tendency in much of the conversation that because we talk so much about climate, we forget that for most people around the planet, there are many other problems that are much more important. So it's really a question of saying yes to a problem, but then how do we fix it? So it's, your message is really a sense of proportion that you say, yes, there's a problem, but I, and I think this is a quote from the book, it's not the end of the world. Explain, it's, it, well, explain it's that definitely to us. not. So, so, you know, the UN climate panel has actually spent a lot of time also looking at how big of a problem is it. So that's typically what climate economists have been doing. They've been doing this for the last 30 years. Uh, the leading guy who's uh, Professor Nordhaus out of Yale University uh, got the Nobel Prize in 2018 for his work. And lots of people have been joining in on this, trying to say, all right, if we try to look at all the different things that global warming is going to impact, so we're going to, we're going to have rising sea levels, we're going to have more heat waves, we're going to have fewer cold waves, but we'll also have lots of other problems. What do all of these problems and benefits, but mostly problems, add up to in total? Their answer in the latest report from 2018, uh, the 1.5 degree report, tells us that if we do nothing about climate change, by the end of the century, the impact will be equivalent to each one of us losing 2.6% of our income. That's not nothing, but it's certainly not what I think a lot of people believe, the end of the world. So Just that's, to give the you economic, of that's the economic impact, is it? Well, it's, it's actually a lot more than, so they try to estimate what are all the impacts. So typically some, some impacts, for instance, food will become more expensive. That's definitely an economic impact. But lots of other things, loss of wetland, uh, the fact that you have to protect much of your infrastructure better will partly be economic, partly non-economic. They actually tried to estimate all of the impacts in money. So the UN actually, because they have to make scenarios all the way to 2100 in order to make their predictions, what they find is that in their central scenario, the average person on the planet will be 450% as rich as he or she is today simply because of general economic growth. So 
these scenarios don't actually look specifically in climate change because they act as the inputs to the climate models. So if, if there was no global warming, to put it bluntly, we would be 450% as rich in 2100 as we are today. Because of global warming, because of the 2.6% reduction, we will only be 434% as rich by the end of the century. Notice that's a very different understanding from what you typically hear today, namely that everything is going to be bleak and terrible by the end of the century. No, everything or most things will be much better, but it'll be slightly less better. Global warming is a problem, not the end of the world. So in other words, there's a trajectory that it needs to be understood against, which is one of improving technology, expanding economy, life conditions improving for large parts of the planet. And so even if there's a negative effect, and even if that's quite serious, it could be more than offset by the improvements over the next century. It, it definitely will be offset. So there's no scenario where you have a negative outcome because of global warming. You have a slightly less positive outcome. So instead of this trajectory, you get one that's slightly lower. And remember also on all the other non-economic variables. So you know the UN estimate will live much longer, possibly up to about 100 years by the end of the century. Uh, we'll all be literate. We'll have much higher education, all these other things. And so it's important to recognize global warming is not the end of the world. It's not the reason why kids should just say, why should I bother go to school? But it's a problem, among many other problems, that we need to fix. One thing that intrigued me from your book is that against the direct negative impacts of a rising temperature, there might even be some positive impacts for some people, and that we should understand it as a balance. Explain that to us. So when you hear the reporting on climate change, you inevitably only hear about things are bad, bad, bad. But remember, any issue will have both negatives and positives. Global warming has more negatives than positives. That's why it's a problem when you sum all of it up. But you're badly informed if you only think it'll have negative impacts. So very clearly, as temperatures rise, you're going to see more heat waves and hence more heat deaths. But as temperatures rise, you're also going to see fewer cold waves and hence fewer cold deaths. Now, that matters because cold deaths probably outweigh heat deaths by about nine to one. So there's about 500,000 uh, uh, heat deaths in the world, about 4.5 million cold deaths as a new Lancet study from this year. So overall, right now, we're actually seeing fewer people die because of global warming. This will not continue. In the long run, it'll probably be a problem that where heat deaths will outweigh uh, avoided cold deaths. But again, you need to know both, otherwise you're not well informed. So are you saying that up until now, global warming has actually produced fewer deaths. In other words, it's been a net positive for humanity. On that specific issue, on heat and cold deaths, it's been a net uh, positive. And that's not me saying it. It's the best study that we have from The Lancet that is the first one looking at global deaths. And it's curious that you haven't heard this in the news. But of course, what you do hear is heat deaths. And yes, they become more, but we should hear both of them. Because this is the kind of thing that would be absolutely denounced as heresy, I'm pretty sure. I mean, it's sort of the joke, as you know, I'm half Swedish. It was a sort of joke we made 10 years ago that, oh, if global warming might be quite a good thing up in the north of Sweden, we could do with a few extra degrees. And that sort of uh, comment has been absolutely disparaged as simplistic thinking because climate change will operate in all sorts of complex ways. And it might well mean that cold places get colder rather than hotter. And we're not supposed to be thinking like that. Are you saying that that idea wasn't so crazy after all? Well, certainly most of the models show that, for instance, Canada, uh, Scandinavia, much of Russia will actually benefit from global warming. But again, I think it's, it's a wrong way to think about it as, oh, there are also benefits, so we don't need to worry. Uh, look, everything has benefits and, and, and disbenefits. We need to just be able to look at all of them. And the fact, as you point out, that we're not allowed to in, in a sense that there is a, there's a sense of you should not be saying that is obviously not good for having a sensible conversation. OK, so before we get on to thinking about how we should be fixing it and the measures you think are sensible, Let's go through some of the myths, because one of the things I enjoyed from your book was actually puncturing some of those myths we hear so often. So myth number one is that small islands will all be submerged as the sea rises. What's the truth of that? 
Well, so it turns out there's lots of researchers who've looked at this. We constantly hear Micronesia, uh, the Maldives or Seychelles or something is going to be flooded. I mean, they're only like a meter or two meters above sea level. So it makes sense as sea levels rise, they're basically going to get flooded. What we forget and what these researchers have done is they've actually taken aerial photographs from back in the 60s or 40s or whenever they've been made and compared them with the islands today. What happens is most of these islands are coral islands, so they have actually occurred because they break off dead coral when there are storms and wash it ashore. That accretes the, uh, the island. That makes the island higher. At the same time, of course, sea level rise makes the island lower. It turns out that at least for now and probably in the foreseeable future, the accretion is higher than the sea level rise. So what you've seen in pretty much all of these, so for all atolls, but probably also for most of the uh, uh, individual islands in these atolls, you've seen increasing areas, not decreasing areas. This is just a fact. And again, it doesn't mean global warming is not real. It doesn't mean that they don't have a problem. If there was no sea level rise, they'd probably be growing even faster, but they're not disappearing and they're not likely to disappear in the uh, near future, or even in this century. Okay, myth number two, extreme weather events are on the rise and they are proof of climate change. True or false? <laughs> I would love to be able to just give you a true or false there. So look, there are some things that we should be aware of. So extreme weather is typically the argument that most people use for climate change. Some extreme things increase. So you're going to see more heat waves, as we talked about before. You're also going to see more uh, uh, heavy rain. Those are the two things that we know are going to happen. For instance, on storms, uh, so hurricanes, you're probably going to see fewer hurricanes, which is actually good, but you'll probably see stronger hurricanes, which is bad. We become much more resilient towards many of these disasters. So as we get richer, we don't get nearly as affected by climate impacts. So what you've actually seen, if you, if you take a graph of how many people die from climate-related disasters, well, we have good data for that for the last 100 years. In the 1920s, about half a million people died each and every year from climate disasters. A lot of them were floods and droughts, uh, especially in China and India that you've never heard of. What's happened since then is it's declined dramatically. So in the 2010s, we were down to 18,000 people, so about 96% reduction in deaths. And last year, it was down to 14,000, so in 2020. And in 2021, we don't obviously have the whole uh, uh, year yet, but it looks like 2021 is set to be even lower at about 6,000. So you hear on one side, one catastrophe after another. And it certainly feels like we're seeing more and more of these damages. But when you look at the data, much of it tells us we're much more resilient. That's absolutely a fact. So we've seen a 99% reduction till 2021 in our deaths. And remember, we have quadrupled the global population at the same time. And we also, and that's important, we've actually seen not increasing levels in many of these indicators. For instance, the best indicator is hurricanes, uh, landfalling hurricanes in the US. Uh, we have not seen an increase either in hurricanes or in strong hurricanes. We've actually seen a slight decrease. Again, the point here is not to say that there's not a problem with extreme weather, but that we're vastly being told a story that's exaggerated and that's not helping us to get grips with the, with the real size of the problem. So climate patterns will change. There may be more heavy rainfall and other things. It doesn't necessarily mean that we're gonna be living in perpetual hurricanes or storms. In fact, they may even go down. But I think the most important point you made there is that actually our ability to deal with them, our technological and sociological techniques for dealing with extreme weather events will continue to get better. So actually, do you project that fewer people will die of extreme oh, weather events in absolutely. let's say 100 years time? Absolutely. We'll see fewer people die and we'll see much less damage in percent of GDP. Remember, you have to adjust for GDP because if you have twice as many houses, a same amount of, of flooding, for instance, will obviously drown twice as many houses. So the reality here is when you look and there's a, a, a very famous study in, in nature that looked at what will happen with hurricanes. Right now, hurricanes cost about 0.04% of global GDP. 
first of all, remember, that's actually a fairly small number compared to what I think most people would believe. If there was no global warming by the end of the century, because we're so much richer and so much better at dealing with these problems, the damage will only be 0.01%. Because of global warming creating more heavy storms, we will see an increase in the damage up to 0.02%. So global warming has a negative impact. But remember, we actually went from 0.04 down to 0.02. 2100 will be a better place, but because of global warming, it'll be not quite as good as it otherwise would have been. Myth number three, lockdowns. This is something that we've talked a lot about on this channel. And you hear a lot that 2020, because it was a lockdown year, was a beautiful year for the climate because there was such little flying around and relatively few emissions. And that actually some people, including Professor Susan Mickey, who we interviewed on this channel, are beginning to think about those kind of measures, lockdown style measures, to combat climate change. What's your view on that? Well, the first thing to realize is, despite the fact that we shut down the entire world, we still emit it almost as much. So we probably cut our emissions about 6% globally. So by having all this amazing shutdown, we managed to cut carbon emissions just a little. And of course, what's happened is we basically soon passed that in 2021. So the net impact of climate from 2020 is zilch. It simply, and, and there's you know, studies that tell us we won't be able to measure this at all, ever. And that tells you another thing, namely, if you actually want to cut carbon emissions, you have to do much more. The UN tells us, and I think it's, it's sort of in your face, they actually tell us if you want to achieve the targets that we promised in Paris, you have, had, you have to have the lockdown that we had in 2020 actually should have been a little tougher. Then you need the carbon emission cuts equivalent to two shutdowns in 2021, to three shutdowns in 2022, and onwards till 2030 when we need 11 shutdowns. Now, obviously, you could do this smarter than what we actually did because the goal of shutdown was not to cut carbon emissions, but it gives you a sense of proportion what we're actually talking about if you really want to achieve the Paris target. I think almost everyone would agree, yeah, I don't want to go there. And that, of course, emphasizes you're not going to solve global warming by telling people no. You're not going to solve this by telling people you can't fly, you can't go on your car, you can't eat meat, you can't do all these things that you like to do because of the climate. You can try and do it, but you will probably see very, very strong resistance. So experience. you're saying that 2020, that extraordinary year where, as you say, the world pretty much shut down, only produced a 6% reduction in emissions. And that's because we still have to heat our homes. We, you know, we sat at home and, and did what we're just doing, you know, assumed instead and, and used electricity in that way. So the, the, the amazing thing is, and, and we don't quite get this, when you shut down one thing, you end up doing something else. And, and so, yes, you can cut your emissions a little bit, but it turns out that it's really, really hard to shut down dramatically. So the, the, the time, the day when China was the most shut down, China still emitted 84% of its normal emissions because you still have to live, you still have to uh, heat your homes and you still have to produce fertilizer for your food and all the other stuff. Myth number four, electric cars. So this is the perhaps the most visible sign that you are a a uh, you know, helpful and responsible citizen, you're going around in your electric car, it's a zero emissions car as they're described. And here in London, the penalties for having a non-compliant, non-green vehicle are only getting steeper and steeper. What is your view of electric cars? So electric cars, first of all, they're wonderful to drive in. You know, one of my friends has a Tesla and it's fun to drive. I always drive it when I'm in California. Uh, so this is not a critique of an electric car per se, but it is to recognize that it's going to deliver very little in the short and medium term. In the long term, it's likely that electric cars will be part of the solution. So even when you look at electric cars, remember, yes, they're being sold as net zero, uh, but what they actually are, they're zero when they're driving, but much of the energy that you tank up your car, unless you live in Norway, is basically fossil fuel. And of course, most of the battery is produced in that 
takes up a lot more energy, is produced in China or somewhere else where it emitted a lot of CO2 uh, from uh, uh, typically from coal-fired power plants. So the reality is the International Energy Agency estimates that every time you buy an electric car, and if you drive it just as much as you would have a gasoline-driven car, you probably save about 10 tons of CO2. So in the EU, that's equivalent to about 600 euros. In the US, it's equivalent to about $60. Uh, dollars. And yet we spend up to $10,000. You know, Germany is just giving 10,000 euros for each electric car. That's a terrible way. So you cut emissions that are worth maybe somewhere between 60 and, uh, and 600 euros, and you pay $10,000 for it. That's a really bad idea. Moreover, most people don't actually drive their electric cars as much. Most people buy their electric car as the second car, uh, typically in the US. Rich people drive it uh, for virtue signaling, and then you drive down to the, uh, to the local mall, and you feel really good about yourselves, but you've actually not cut very much emissions. You've just bought an extra car, and you mostly bought it for subsidies that other people, that is, the rest of the, uh, of the US or the poor will have to help sponsor. That's not a very smart or effective way to tackle this problem. It's, it's still better though, isn't it? I mean, in theory, if, if everyone on the planet was driving an electric car as opposed to a gas car, a petrol car, I mean, that would be better for the planet, right? Y yes, it probably would. There's a whole other conversation about how do you actually get the, enough resources to do all the batteries. It turns out that we don't really know how to scale this up. There's a huge amount of other pollution issues uh, with mining all the uh, raw materials that go into the battery. It probably is, but it's not anywhere near what most people think of as this amazing solution. Right now, it's one of the least effective and most costly ways to cut a little bit of CO2 and mostly get the rich people to feel good about themselves. And surely that's not how we actually want to fix climate. Myth number five, polar bears. So this one made me chuckle a little bit because the, the image of the polar bear on a small and reducing ice float is one that we are now really quite familiar with. Every David Attenborough nature series seems to end with that. It's almost the symbol of the bleak future we're going towards, where these beautiful creatures won't have a habitat that they can thrive in. In your book, you say that the number of polar bears is actually going up. Well, and, and again, I'm just using the polar bear research group, who are the ones who've actually looked at the amount of polar bears, uh, and the ones who are also talking a lot about the climate impending climate doom for, for the polar bears. And what we have is, uh, remember uh, uh, just 40, 50 years ago, we used to shoot a lot of polar bears. And one of the good things we did was we said, let's stop doing that. So we've probably gone from somewhere between five and 10,000 polar bears up till today, where we have about 25,000 polar bears. So that by all means should be a tremendous success for, uh, for uh, conservation. Instead, most people tell us, but they're all going to die because of global warming. First of all, remember, the polar bears lived through, uh, certainly at the last time, there was probably no ice on the, uh, in the Arctic, which was uh, five to 8,000 years ago. Uh, they lived through that. So clearly, it's not the end of the world for them. But also, and I think we need to recognize, we're still seeing a trending upwards of polar bears. And the real thing that just strikes me as so absurd is, when people are saying we should help save the polar bear by cutting car a ton of carbon emissions, remember that will save one or two polar bears per year. Yet every year we shoot almost a thousand polar bears. If you want to save the polar bears, you know, stop shooting a thousand polar bears first. Myth number six, Bjorn, meat. This is one you hear a lot, which is that if we're going to be good responsible citizens doing our bit towards combating climate change, we should become vegetarian. Eating meat mm. is in some way very bad for the climate. What's your take on that? Well, so I'm a vegetarian, so I love the idea of everybody else joining me and, and it'll certainly open up my choices at restaurants. But the reality is that going meat free is only gonna do a little bit for uh, climate. We often hear that, oh, it's 50% of your food intake. And you only hear the 50%, so you can apparently reduce 50%, but it's only 50% of your food emissions. So the reality is 
when you look at the total impact, it's about, so, you know, take the biggest uh, uh, meta study that we have, it's about 4%. So if you cut out all of your meat and become vegetarian, you will cut your emissions about 4%. That's not nothing. How does but that also, actually work, can I just ask? Because I've, I've never really yeah. understood this. Is the argument against meat that it's inefficient to rear livestock because they take so much carbon and they don't produce very much and therefore it's a kind of carbon intensive thing that you're eating? Or is it this business of cows actually farting and producing gas directly? What is the problem it's, it's, with meat? It's both of this. So, so these studies try to incorporate, and remember, this is really, really difficult. So they try to incorporate all the extra land that they use, all the extra uh, 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 grain typically that they'll be eating. So all animals are less efficient. Uh, cows, obviously, much less efficient than, for instance, chicken. Uh, and then you try to average it over what people eat in Western diets. And then you try to say, what would the, be the similar impact if you then made it up with other, uh, 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 you'd probably eat more milk, you'd probably eat more cheese, you'd mostly eat more protein from, for instance, soybeans and others. What you find then is if you do those two menus, you end up cutting about 4% of your other of your emissions, about 12 uh, tons, down to a little less than 12 tons, so about 11.5 uh, tons. So that's a little nice. There's two things you need to remember. One is that when you go vegetarian, we know typically that a vegetarian diet everywhere in, in the rich world is cheaper. So that means you now save money, you don't buy these big steaks, you're gonna spend that money on other stuff that also emits uh, CO2. And so if you take that rebound, as the economists uh, call it, that you're gonna spend this maybe on a trip to Mallorca or something else, you actually end up emitting about 2% of these. So this is a study from Sweden that shows so instead of cutting 4%, you'll actually only, when you take into account that you're going to spend that extra money you save from being a vegetarian on other stuff, you'll only cut about 2%. Now, that's still fine. And by all means, if you want to go vegetarian, that's great. And there are other reasons why you might want to do that. But you need to realize that this is equivalent to buying about 500 kilos of CO2 emission rights on the European uh, uh, emissions trading system, which is about 30 euros. So for 30 euros, you can buy, you could, you could basically um, uh, reduce your emission just as much and you can eat all the meat you want. It gives you a sense of proportion. This is not the main way we're gonna solve the problem. Myth number seven, wildfires. So this is a really serious one because we've had, it feels like a really bad couple of years of wildfires. California has had some terrible fires and Greece uh, similarly has been ravaged by these fires and a lot of people see those and think this is global warming, this is climate change becoming real in front of us. What's your sense of the truth of that? Well, so again, we get that feeling. You're absolutely right. You know, we see these pictures and we're constantly being reminded this is global warming. So not surprisingly, people are very sure that this must be global warming. But if we look at the data, and again, that's what I try to do, we've actually seen that wildfire has been declining in amount of burnt area pretty much every year since 1900. So from 1900, we only have model estimates. It has gone down from about 4.2% of the Earth's surface to about 3% every year that's being burned. And in the satellite area, we obviously have much, much better data. We have it from 1997 till today. Uh, it used to be about 3, 3.2%. And now it's down, so 2021 seems slated to be one of the lowest at 2.5%. And if you look further in the climate models, they also estimate that, yes, if you only look at CO2, you're gonna see more fire, but if you assume that people are also actually gonna to adapt to this, which is what we've been doing for the last 100 years, you will see even lower levels of fire. This is very contrary to what we hear. So also for the US, we've seen declining levels of fire. For Europe, we've seen declining levels of fire. Remember Australia, we've seen declining levels of fire. Actually, the big Australian fire that you saw in 2019-20 uh, that was on the cover of every uh, news magazine uh, and every paper in the world, we now have the satellite data. And what it shows us that yes, Eucalyptus forests that are close to where new stations are burnt a lot more 
But overall, Australia had one of its lowest burns ever. It used to burn in the early 1900, about 12 percent of the area of Australia every year. Uh, it, it, it's down to about six, eight percent, uh, typically in the early 2000s. In 2019-20, uh, it burnt little less than 4%. It was, according to Australia Environment, it was one of the lowest levels ever. Okay, so we've gone through quite a few myths there and you've tried to give a bit more of a sense of perspective. People will be watching and thinking, okay, so each of these things doesn't fix the problem on its own, but in aggregate, maybe they make a difference or what else should we be doing? I mean, Bjorn, tell us, what is your solution? For this problem. Because global warming is a problem, we definitely should find a solution. We should recognize first, I think, that this is not the end of the world. Because if it's the end of the world, you think, well, we got to throw everything in the kitchen sink at it. And we've kind of been trying to do that for the last 30 years. And that's the second lesson. We haven't succeeded very well. While we've, you know, uh, we, we now have COP26, we've had 26 COP meetings, we've had climate policies since 1992, and we've pretty much blown all of the promises that we've made. Maybe we need to start thinking about a different approach. And so my argument would be to say, don't try to make stuff that is incredibly hard and incredibly expensive. That's typically what we've done with both the Rio Agreement, with Kyoto, and now with Paris. It's stuff that nobody really wants to deliver that's gonna cost everyone a lot of money, and so at the end, we're gonna fudge it, not really do it. We're gonna do a little bit and feel really, really poor from it. Instead, what we should realize is, first, we should have a global carbon tax, that's going to be really, really hard to do. But you know, any economist would say if there's a net bad out there, you simply tax it. So a carbon tax is a smart thing. We should have a fairly low one, $20, $40 per ton of CO2, and steadily rising across the century. We will not be able to do that, but we should at least try to do something along those lines. The correct uh, carbon tax will cut about half of the emissions of the century, but it'll mostly cut towards the end of the century where it's cheapest to cut and there'll be more uh, innovation. So in reality, it will only cut temperatures a little bit. So in the standard sense from 4.1 degrees down to 3.5 degrees. That's nice, but it's not going to solve most of the problem. That's why we need innovation. We really need to recognize that we've never solved anything as a global community by telling everyone, don't do this. If we can innovate cheaper green energy down below the price of fossil fuels, we're done. We don't have to have all these arm twisting exercises at COP26 and so on, because we'll simply have everyone dashing to get these cheaper energy technologies. So in reality, the most part of the fix on, on climate change is not gonna be about carbon taxes, let's try it but it's mostly going to be about innovation. If you get a cheap innovation, everyone will use it. So what does that mean in terms of a bit more detail then? I mean, does that mean wind? Does that mean solar? Does that mean nuclear? I mean, that's the controversial one, isn't it? Where is this innovation going to come from and where should the investment be directed? Well, if I knew that, I'd be a lot richer. So I, I think fundamentally, the point is we don't have that technology right now, but we have a lot of opportunities. So as you point out, solar and wind would be amazing if we had an enormous amount of cheap storage. So if we can make batteries and solar or and or wind much cheaper, that could be one solution. Certainly nuclear could also be uh, a, a great opportunity. Remember, nuclear doesn't emit any uh, CO2. It's a baseload power. That is, you can have it on all the time. So it has a lot of the right uh, 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 sort of uh, parameters. The problem is that right now, nuclear, when you build new nuclear, is incredibly expensive. So a lot of people are arguing that's the third generation nuclear. A lot of people are arguing, but the fourth generation nuclear is going to be a lot safer, a lot cheaper, a lot better. You can you know, modulize it and all this stuff. It's just going to be wonderful. I think we should definitely be spending research money on getting fourth generation nuclear. But I just want us to realize 
They also said about the other three generations that they would be incredibly cheap and incredibly safe, and they didn't turn out that way. So again, the point here is we don't know whether solar and wind with lots of batteries or whether nuclear is going to be a solution, but they could do, be two of the great ones. There's obviously also fusion energy, Can which is sort of- Can I just say that on nuclear, I thought the issue with nuclear is, first of all, it does require uranium or some kind of uh, for fuels from the earth and so it's not totally neutral and second of all because it produces this waste that then needs to be stored somewhere or buried or put at the bottom of the sea it's not actually truly green what is that not true so i mean look solar panels uh, also produce lots of uh, toxic waste uh, we we have no idea how we're going to recycle all the wind turbine uh, the uh, the plastic uh, uh, fibers so Everything has an impact, certainly if you're going to power the entire world with it. But nuclear, just like solar and wind, and I'm not saying this to uh, denigrate solar and wind. I mean, they all all big solutions will have problems, but they're not insurmountable. But Bjorn, I, I'm waiting for the silver bullet here. I mean, we, you, ah, we I was saying, so, what are the solutions? We say well, we yes, should do a carbon so, tax, but that probably won't work. We should invest in nuclear, but hey, that's still really expensive and disappointed us last time. When do we get to the good news bit? Well. I think I think the good news is that it is very likely that innovation is the thing that will actually fix this problem for us, because there's a lot of different ways that this could go. As we talk about solar and wind with batteries, it could be fusion, sorry, fission. It could also be fusion, which definitely has great potential, but also do we know whether this works? And there are lots of other ideas. Just to give you one, uh, Craig Venter, the guy who cracked the human genome and back in 2000, he has this plan of basically growing algae on the ocean surface. And these algae would be uh, possibly genetically engineered to basically soak up sunlight and CO2 and produce oil. So we could basically harvest oil on the ocean surface. We could keep our entire energy infrastructure, but it would be run by zero oil, zero CO2 emissions oil, because they just soaked it up out in the ocean surface. Again, this doesn't work in scale and certainly not uh, cost effective, but through innovation, maybe it could become so. The point here is not to recognize that there's one particular thing that's going to solve in the next five years, but there's a lot of promising ways that potentially could solve this problem, and we should be spending much more resources on every one of them. Remember, we have, over the last 20 or 30 years, we've seen declining levels of investment in research and development into green energy because we've been so focused on saying, no, no, we got to spend money on buying solar panels or buying existing inefficient wind turbines instead of making the next generation of them become much cheaper. That's where we should be spending our money. So actually, Obama and all the other world leaders, when they met in Paris, uh, they also met at the sidelines of Paris and made what they called the mission innovation. They promised to double their investment in research and development into green energy. Uh, I'm, I'm glad to say we were a tiny part of the reason why they did that. That was great. But unfortunately, they have not lived up to the UK, the US. Almost nobody has lived up to this. They have increased it slightly, but not nearly enough. And we probably need to increase it sixfold instead of double it because innovation, we know from past experience, is the most likely way to fix this. So I'm sorry I can't give you sort of, oh, this is, this is the magic bullet, but it is very likely that one or maybe more of these technologies are going to be the ones that power the 21st century. Why do you think that attitude has set in and that the kind of approach you're talking about, which is... I guess a more optimistic or it's a more technology focused idea that we can actually solve this as we have with previous problems. It's become instead more of a moral issue and a sign of you know, sacrifice and that we need to change our way of life and, and so on. Why do you think that happened? Well, I think part of it is because it never feels good, it never feels right if we just sort of fix it like that. Uh, remember how we all had to switch our light bulbs, our incandescent light bulbs to CFC uh, lamps, those compact fluorescent lamps, that bad lighting and took forever to start them and they flickered and all kinds of stuff. People hated them, but we outlawed them to make ourselves feel like we were doing something. Then of course, right after we actually had an innovation with the LED lights that are beautiful light, they're much cheaper, they're much more effective and everybody has now switched to them. We should not shift to the stuff that make that hurts us all, but it 
feels like you're you know you're sacrificing much more. You know what the standard argument I I I get against what I'm saying is, but it's too late. We got to act right now. We don't have time to wait five, ten, or twenty, or more realistically, thirty or forty years for these solutions to arrive. And I get that. If you think this is the end of the world, if you think that we just have nine years left and then we're all going to die, then clearly we just got to throw everything at this problem. But the reality is, this is a problem, not the end of the world. And that's why we can also be much more realistic. I would also say, though, even if we do what people who are very, very scared say, we got to do everything right now, all we're really going to do, and what's, of course, going to come out of COP26, is basically that we're going to make a lot of nice promises and we're going to default on them like we've done with all the others. So in some sense, I don't think doing what we've been doing for the last 30 years, just louder and more, is actually going to solve anything. It's just going to make us feel good, but actually going to end up with us not solving very much of climate change. Björn Lomberg, thank you so much. Thank you. That was Björn Lomborg, the Danish writer of False Alarm and commentator on climate issues. During the next couple of weeks, we are all probably going to hear a lot about climate change and all of the terrible things that are going to happen. And no doubt, many of them are true. And we should certainly take the thing very seriously. But let's allow room for some alternative perspectives. And quite a lot of what Bjorn said there seemed pretty sensible to me. Interested to know your thoughts? Do comment underneath. This was Unheard.